All righty, we are live. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our live stream today. My name is Courtney. I am the development coordinator at Access Assault Care Center. Um, I'll be guiding the discussion today where we'll talk about housing and how it intersects with domestic violence. This is part of our Domestic Violence Awareness Month live series here on Facebook. We did one last Friday uh, that covered just Domestic Violence 101. Um, and that one's up on our page if you missed it. Um, otherwise, today we're jumping into some awesome panelists that we have here that um, all work locally to end homelessness. So I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. If we want to just start with some introductions, state your name, um, your job, and how long you've been in the field. That way everyone kind of gets a feel for who's on the call. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, I don't know. Rachel, you go ahead and start for us. Uh, my name is Rachel Glenn. I'm the housing program supervisor with Access Assault Care Center, um, and I've been in the anti-violence field for just over a year now. Awesome. Jody, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Jody Stumbo. I'm the executive director at the Bridge Home, formerly known as the Emergency Residence Project. Um, and professionally, I've been in the anti-violence violence field probably about three years, um, but honestly, probably since college, I've been doing different kinds of work personally regarding anti-violence. Josh? Yeah, I'm Josh and I'm a housing advocate at Access and I have been in the field full-time for the last two years, but did it in college, so with a total of eight years. Right. Last but not least. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi everyone. You're all making me feel so old. I am uh, Zeb Bioki McCallum. I am the Director of Housing and Economic Justice at the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And I have been doing domestic violence work and work at the intersection of housing and domestic violence for about 12 years. And I've been working on affordable housing and economic justice issues for longer than that. Great, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, let's just start with what kind of housing services does your agency offer to survivors? I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer that one first. I can go, Courtney. Great. And just to make you feel better, uh, Zeb, I have been in the nonprofit world for more than 20 years, so I'm not, I'm not in the same category as the, the other two. <laughs> um, okay, so housing services, um, we have a variety of services that we offer to folks who may be experiencing violence um, or in an unsafe position. Um, we really have what we call a continuum of care um, that goes from everything if they need emergency shelter um, so if they're fleeing and they need emergency shelter, um, we can help them there. And then once they come into our programs, if they come in under the emergency shelter, then we have a caseworker that works with them to help them find housing. Um, and we have a variety of different programs based on the individual's needs, um, you know, that can help them for just a short amount of time or from anywhere from, you know, three months to two years or more, um, it, depending on the type of help that they need to stabilize and keep their housing. Great. Zeb, do you wanna talk about your agency? Sure. The coalition is a little, we're a little different than kind of the other folks on here because we don't do, we do very minimal kind of that direct service um, help for survivors. We really, we function. So the Iowa Coalition Against Domestic Violence is a statewide, organization. So we serve all corners of the state. And our focus is really on ensuring that there is quality services um, for all of the domestic violence um, shelters and housing programs that are out there. So I spend a lot of my time working with all of those programs. If anybody is ever sort of struggling um, to get what they need from their local program, they can always reach out to the coalition and we connect folks and we help them out. We do uh, um, some uh, direct services around uh, financial literacy, um, as well as some legal services for 
immigrant families, but really very limited right now um, due to funding. Most of our most of our work is uh, just promoting the awesome work of the domestic violence programs locally in the state. So Rachel and Josh, give us a peek inside of Access. Um, so for Access, we provide, we work directly um, with survivors and we have an emergency shelter program where we directly house survivors of domestic violence um, and sexual violence as well. Um, and then we also have outreach programs um, for clients who are struggling with housing, um, but may not be living in our shelter. Um, and those are our homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing programs. And Josh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. Yeah, I always thought this might be interesting since we're both from the same agency, we might just copy and paste each other's answers, <laughs> but we both get credit for it. So, um, yeah, so to just elaborate on a bit more with our shelter, it's 24 seven program where you can give or our hotlines are 24 seven program where you can give us a call and we can try to assess worth how we can coordinate you with shelter or if for some reason shelter isn't the best model for you we can find some other ways to help out with housing in general. So yeah, like you mentioned, some outreach. So for example, to name some programs, rapid rehousing or homeless prevention, we try to find ways where we can meet with survivors and we can help them with that big financial barrier that they may be facing and trying to relocate to a new place. Or also trying to help them relocate to a place where they may have potential housing and then their issues transportation. So we try to help them coordinate with that as well. Awesome. Sounds like some great work that you all are doing. Um, let's talk about why it's important that domestic violence survivors have housing assistance and have access to these programs. I'll go back to you, Jody. <laughs> okay. Um, well, kind of before I address that, I'll, I will just say that we work very closely with access. Um, so our staff communicates sometimes multiple times a day um, to, to serve the folks in the Two Rivers region. Um, the Two Rivers region is Story County, Hardin County, Green County, Marshall County, um, and Boone County um, is the region that uh, is the area that we serve as, as does access. And so we really work together to find the best place for the individuals or the families to go. Um, you know, if they're full, they may get a hold of us, or if somebody comes to us, we may get a hold of them. And um, the reason that this is so important, and I know that the rest of you can even speak um, more strongly to this because we serve the general population and we're, we're not specialists in, in violence. We have, you know, training and those kinds of things, but we do serve the general public. But it is so important for people that are fleeing these situations to have housing because um, I think their lives are so unstable. Um, they, they typically don't have any support system around them. And again, you guys can speak to this better than me, but when someone is in a domestic violence situation, typically what happens is the abuser has totally isolated them from any outside support. So, you know, people will say, well, why don't they just leave? Well, they don't have any way to leave. They don't have anybody to support them or get them out of the situation. So the it's just vital that our programs and access programs and the, the work that Zeb does is available to people because they literally don't have any place else to go. You guys have anything else to add? Rachel, Josh, Zeb? Well, I was gonna jump in and say, uh, I think Jody puts it well, it's about survivors facing that yeah, often impossible choice um, between a rock and a hard place of of leaving home that for for us so often we think of of home is that that safe place that's where we go to relax recover sort of decompress from the day 
a lot of us now in COVID are spending a lot more times in our homes and that gets flipped when it comes to domestic violence, mm -hmm. that, that home can become the most uh, scary, frightening, unexpected place to be. And so our work is about unflipping that, creating safe homes again, allowing people a way out of that impossible choice, that there is a place to go and a way to, to, to recreate homes for, for people, for their families, for their kids that, that are safe uh, and can be safe for a long time. It's a really great way to put it. And to add on to that, Zeb, um, it reminds me, some of that I usually say with our volunteer trainings is that a home, the safest place in the world is a place that you can call home whether that's a studio apartment or a four bedroom house. I know for me, four bedrooms is way too much space for me. I'm content with a one bedroom apartment, but it's the idea of just having a place where you can just relax, de-stress and feel safe. Like to some people that can be various things, but to have a roof over your head and walls around you, protect you from weather is just paramount to part of recovery, especially with uh, survivors. I mean, they may be facing insecurities another way, just getting safe food, uh, just having a safe place, getting clothing, shelter for their kids. And like Jody said, you know, sometimes they face problems and outsiders will say, well, why don't you just sleep? And if it was that simple, they would just sleep. But sometimes it's not. They don't have another place they can call home. And while they're trying to recover from this abuse, if they don't have a home, their stability is just taken out from underneath them. It's really hard to recover and heal if you don't have a place where you can just relax and, you know, get away from everything, even for a minute or five minutes. Yeah, and kind of to that point, you kind of mentioned that there's other factors playing into it. There's some barriers that they could face while um, accessing safe housing. Can you guys talk about what those barriers might be um, and what you do to help them overcome those barriers? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Um, and even to kind of continue with what Josh was just discussing. So access, we have a housing first shelter model where we believe that um, how stable housing will lead to success in so many areas of someone's life. Um, and just stable and safe housing is just the absolute cornerstone foundational block um, for so many of us. Um, and survivors do experience barriers. One of the most underrated questions I think of all time is I don't think that people realize the amount of barriers that sometimes clients face. Um, and especially in a time of COVID where not everyone has the privilege of stable internet access uh, or cell phones or the privilege to be able to do things virtually. Um, so right now in the pandemic world, that's so incredibly valid if somebody potentially has been with their abuser for years at a time and um, they have multiple evictions on their record that can help that can be a major barrier potentially a criminal record um, and a whole just so many extra barriers Josh Jody Zeb I don't know if you want to speak more to that yeah and I think what I want to add on to that um, you know, another thing with providing the, the safe housing, um, another barrier that people often don't think about is, um, so if, if, the, if they get out of the situation, if they get out of where they're in, um, that doesn't mean it's over. Oftentimes the abuser tries to find them um, track them down. Um, and so a couple of things like with access, their locations are not disclosed so that they have that additional pr protection because we are just a general population shelter. Um, our, air, our addresses are disclosed. So if the abuser does find out where they're at, they could come here, um, but our staff are trained and we know if, if that person shows up, um, you know, that we work with the individual who may be here, we get a no trespass order to make sure that they can stay safe. Um, but that's another reason that if, 
if a domestic violence victim comes to us, we always connect with access because it's always going to be better for them to be in an undisclosed location. Um, but if that option isn't there, um, then we're going to take them in because we can help them stay safe, um, you know, even though we may have a, a public location. So I think that's another thing that people don't always think about. Um, just because you get out, it's, it's not over. Um, and then there's so many different things. So um, Rachel had mentioned maybe having, you know, many evictions because of, of who they were living with. Well, we've had situations where the individual who we've worked with had never had their name on a lease because that was another way of controlling them. Um, if their name isn't on the lease and they don't have any rental history, it, it, that's hard. Where, where are they going to go? How are they going to get out? So there's just all these different ways um, that that the abusers can put up these obstacles that you really don't even think about um, that these that these individuals are facing. Zeb and Josh, do you have any last thoughts on barriers that you wanted to add? I was just going to say I think it's really important to emphasize how often um, the the folks who perpetrate domestic violence or or do harm to families intentionally use systems, uh, whether it, it's it's landlord screening processes. So 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 they know, hey, if if the person that I am uh, committing harm against has an eviction, it makes it harder for them to leave. Well, let's let's see, figure out how I can get an eviction on that record. You know, if if I am am uh, bringing drugs into the apartment, and then the victim calls the police. Well, then I can get her with an eviction and a criminal record, which then adds to this, making it harder for the victim to leave. And she hasn't done anything. All she's done is put out a call for help, and now has a couple marks against her that just makes harding that much much more difficult. A lot of it, we talk about that um, perpetrators of violence are attempting to, to build a, a cage around their victim. And our goal, the, the goal of, of all of this work is to dismantle that cage, to provide a, a, a brighter, more positive future. And I, I'll say, you know, cause I get to work with Rachel and Josh a lot. They are really good at dismantling this cage and overcoming these barriers, so. Yeah, uh, so he brought the example of like evictions. That's one we encounter a lot where the survivors we work with, a lot of the things on their record were never their fault in the first place. But when a landlord sees us in a background check, they're not gonna see who did what. And that's kind of where Access tries to step in and be the middle person saying like, hey, hey here's what's happened. This is why that's on their record. Um, so it's trying to be that middle person that can help a survivor talk to the landlord about that, in a sense, kind of translating what the survivor is trying to say, because the survivor is not going to have their uh, total mindset at 100% when they're in the middle of trying to deal with all of this. And in addition to that, another barrier I've seen a lot is when they're trying to escape their abusers, sometimes their abusers have control of their finances. And when they're trying to look to move into a new apartment, often they're asked for first month's rent and security deposit up front. And that's a big chunk of change to try to get over just to get into a new place. And fortunately, we have some programs where we can help out with that. And we try to help clients or help survivors get over that barrier. And fortunately, we also work with some landlords who also are understanding of that. And it provides some wiggle room where they have it where they don't have to pay first month's rent right off the bat, but they can later once they get more stabilized and they can work, find employment or a good steady source of income. A lot of great information. Thanks guys. Um, what's something that you wish the general public or the community knew about domestic violence that you've learned since working in this field? Zeb, let's start with you. You haven't started yet. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to start because I love this question. Um, I think I think that the the 
the general public doesn't understand how strong the people that we get to work with are every day how how smart and talented and creative people who experience domestic violence and homelessness actually are and that really by the time that folks are interacting with with our programs so many things have gone wrong uh, so many of the skills and abilities and things that they've attempted just haven't worked out that that's led them to kind of end up um needing needing our help and needing our services and that really uh survivors are awesome brave courageous um incredibly capable people who just who just need a little help and i think I, that's the part that I wish people get. We, we in our society tend to do so much work looking down on people who are less fortunate rather than, than recognizing their, their strengths and abilities. And that's, that's what we have to get better at. How about you, Jody? Um, I think, um, kind of along the lines of what Zeb was saying is um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there um, about who does this happen to? How could this ever happen to somebody? I would never let that happen to me. Um, this doesn't discriminate. It could be a CEO. Um, it could be your best friend. You know, it could be your daughter's friend. Um, it, it, it's not something that people allow to happen to them. Um, it is a, a, a slow, meticulous process that happens over time. Um, and it can happen to anybody. And, and I think kind of what Zeb was saying, that's so important for everybody to remember is it could be you. Um, you just don't know who's who's facing these things. And it's important to not, you know, they're, they're not the person that's doing something wrong. They're the person that needs our help and our support and our, our encouragement um, to, to, to really help them see that they're valued. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to echo what both Zeb and, and Jody have said, especially with the, it can happen with anyone, violence knows no discrimination um, based off of uh, gender, sexual identity, racial or ethnic identity. It, it absolutely everyone, anyone and everyone. And we don't mean that in a fear mongering sort of way, but definitely in an awareness, being aware of, of those that are around you and checking in on people and also just what Zeb said the resiliency in this field is astounding um the the amount of bravery and courage to simply make the phone call to our helpline or reach out on our chat line on our website um to simply do that is astronomical and and also that compassion is contagious I believe uh, uh, my team is fantastic, especially like Josh is a member of my team and and he has definitely just contagious compassion and so did the other members of my team and being able to see that and, and when we get to work with our clients and, and they see that compassion, there are times when they're just so compassionate towards us and there's that moment where we're like, but wait, I'm supposed to be the one that's helping you, and yet you're helping me learn. And so the compassion and resiliency in this field is just off the charts. And I mean, all this is great stuff. I feel like we're all just bobbleheads because we all just say something that we all agree with. So we're all in alignment <laughs> on a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, every time this topic comes up, everybody knows domestic violence is awful. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who said it was okay, but the difficulty is it still happens. And I always try to find like, what can more people do to help? And the thing is you don't have to be part of a program that any of us on this call are part of. I mean, you can volunteer 
we all love volunteers. But the simple way to like really help out is to just listen and believe people when they tell you they have an experience. And I understand why people might feel hesitant about that because they don't think it can happen to them or their friends or their family. They think it's something that happens on movies or TV shows or books, but it does happen no matter the population, whether it's a small town or a city and to just empathize. You do not need 32 hours of victim counselor training to simply empathize with someone. And when someone does bring that up, take it seriously. They're not doing it for attention. And also understand, yeah, this happens to anyone, whether it's that city council member who is loved by the community and is well polished or a homeless person who may not have had a shower for months and doesn't look great. Like no matter what that person is or how they present themselves, domestic violence is not okay. And they don't deserve that treatment. And so that's why we're here to just say, just listen and empathize and overall, I think we sometimes underestimate how harmful judgment can be. And that when a victim goes through horrible circumstances, the last thing they need their own mentality to say is that they deserved it or that they did something to earn that. You can be that person that just steps in and say, that was not your fault. I don't think that was your fault. I'm here to tell you it wasn't. I mean, it just sounds so simple to just listen to someone and believe them. But that is a lot. It may not feel like a lot to you, but it is a lot to them. So overall, just empathize. No, I'm insecure of my bobblehead, but totally. <laughs> Every, everything you guys said, it's just, I think that was spot on. Um, okay, let's end on a happier note. Um, what's something happening in our community or at your agency that you're excited about and that you want people to know about? I would actually be happy to start this one. We were just talking about this within our team. Um, I am excited about people exercising their right to vote in the upcoming election um, because voting is a way that you can help survivors of domestic violence and, and getting in contact with your elected officials. Um, so I know that that's something that I'm really excited about going on in my community. Something I'm excited about um, that we've utilized more is a local program called Wheels for Work, where they provide a vehicle, well, a donated vehicle to a single parent with kids and they're employed. And that can be a barrier to a lot of people we work with that they just need transportation to get to their job and home or to also just shop for groceries and other basic needs. And it really touched me. I was talking to uh, what was his name? Casey with Ames Ford Lincoln. And he told me a really nice story is that someone said that when their mother got their car and they said, we were able to go get ice cream the other day as a family for the first time. And he said, oh, okay, that's neat. And she said, no, I don't think you understand. It has been years since we've been able to do that. And it was just such a small thing to him and me hearing that story, such a small thing, but also realize that is huge for a family, for a mother to be able to do that with their kids. Um, so it's just really eye-opening to see how that program can really help someone in need like that. So I'm always excited for that program. Um, well, I think from um, our end, there's a couple of things that are going on. Um, one of them being just the collaboration that is happening right now in the Two Rivers region with our agencies. Um, I, I wasn't joking when I said <laughs> we're speaking with each other sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and, and it's really, really been wonderful to see this collaboration grow and progress. And we are just doing such an amazing job of, of effectively and efficiently serving those in our region that are in need um, and getting them help faster. And that's just really exciting for me. Um, in July alone, my staff housed 17 households. Um, and this is just, you know, 
amazing um, in this time of craziness that we're we're still being able to do this. We've made some shifts in our programming um, and and how we work with clients, and it's it's a much more it's a, you know a caseworker based system, and we've seen amazing results with that and being able to really get people stable, and then stick with them to make sure they're stable even after they're exiting our program. So I'm super excited about that and the collaboration with all the other agencies. Um, and then I think the other thing that I'm, I'm really excited about is um, the vision for the future that my organization has and that other organizations in Two Rivers are a part of this vision. Um, we're in the beginning um, stages of, of discussing um, building a new campus, a uh, new facility for us that better serves our clients. Our organization was originally originally born to basically serve men. And as everybody on this call knows, uh, we are seeing so many women. We are seeing so many families and we just don't have the facilities to serve them. So the new campus we're envisioning would be bring equitable services to all populations and demographics. And it's also going to provide an opportunity for other organizations to have space on our campus. So the people we're serving can get services in a centralized area. Um, so that's something that's really exciting and we're really looking forward to uh, you know, getting more details out about this as we move forward. But um, I think it's just gonna help all of our organizations um, to just be more effective and better help those who really need us. Awesome. Oh. So, how about you? I love hearing about collaboration and, and uh, folks that don't do this work every day don't actually know how, how sometimes difficult it can be for domestic violence organizations and mainstream homeless organizations to collaborate with each other. So it is a testament to everybody on here um, of their abilities to figure out how to make that collaboration work. Um, the one thing that I'm excited about in the future is for so long, we have focused our, our, in domestic violence, in our domestic violence conversation about uh, a, providing services to the victim and punishment to to the abuser to the person doing harm that is that's been our our focus on this is is kind of those two paths and and the results on that have been mixed just being honest over the last 30 years sort of the, we talked about before that domestic violence is still happening and and we are trying to figure out um going forward how to provide more more services to the family, to everyone engaged in domestic violence to get the domestic violence to stop. And that that can manifest itself or come about in, in lots of different ways, housing being an essential component of that. And I don't know where all of the, what all the answers are yet, but it makes me very excited about getting to that vision and a place where there is less domestic violence, that the domestic violence is, is not happening anymore. And that's, an, that's a work that's gonna take all of us. And it's gonna take all of us all the time to do that work, but I think it's possible. Sounds like some awesome stuff that we all have to look forward to. We're ending um, the near of our time, the end of our time here. Uh, thanks again to all of our guests to joining us today um, and talking about the importance of housing assistance. Um, and thanks to all of you who tuned in. Make sure to check out the links below with all the resources that we talked about and then join us next Friday to talk about domestic violence through a public health lens. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.